Okay, um, let me go ahead and get started. Could I request folks to please um, add your name to the, um, let me just paste this in again, um, agenda, and um, also to add in any topics uh, that you'd like to discuss. The background here is that uh, I've been working with uh, the team from Volk and some folks from Cisco and Intel and Red Hat and, and elsewhere for, um, believe it or not, 10 months now, but uh, intensively for about six to build out this CNF testbed. And the idea for it is to uh, have a um, straightforward uh, way to talk about increased use of Kubernetes by telcos. And um, it's conjoined with this concept of cloud native network functions or CNFs uh, and how you could transition VNFs to CNFs, which um, of course sounds nice, but um, in practice winds up having a lot of, uh, of challenges to, um, to move through. So I'm a little hesitant. Well, uh, no, I guess we have a few new folks on. So I, I think maybe I'll just take um, five or eight minutes and walk through the beginning of this uh, CNF testbed presentation. And I think that would be some useful context um, for folks to have um, about uh, how this community comes together. Lucina, would you mind um, sharing it? Um, and then I can just walk through um, some of our thinking and, and, and um, I think that would then lead naturally into the next steps conversation. Um, so uh, on slide two, yeah, thank you, Lucina. Um, I, I'll just remind folks that the Linux Foundation is much more than just Linux. So CNCF on the cloud has been um, collaborating very closely with LF networking. And as we'll talk about, we've made use of a bunch of BNFs out of their ONAP project. Um, and have the hope or expectation of using more over time. Uh, slide three is uh, the overview of CNCF that we now have five graduated projects and uh, 15 incubating ones and there's 17 uh, platinum members that are backing us. And in one way of seeing the CNF testbed project is to say that CNCF has been extraordinarily successful bringing together the whole public cloud community and also the whole enterprise software community. And uh, the question then is, what would it take for us to expand to telcos and their vendors? And slide four is a look at LF networking. And you can see that they have um, 20, I mean, uh, 10 uh, carrier members at the highest level and a number of uh, platinum vendor members at the top level. And so um, they're now um, providing networking software to uh, carriers representing more than 70% of all subscribers around the world. And uh, ONAP is their kind of biggest and most um, important project. Uh, it is very much designed for a multi, what they call multi-VIM world uh, that is um, supporting multiple different virtual information managers like VMware and OpenStack and Kubernetes and others. And one of the things that we're trying to do with this work is, is to show a possible path forward for them that they may get some meaningful advantages to optimizing that work uh, for Kubernetes. The, essentially, the vision would be to have ONAP do a lot less to, to do much more the emitting cont containers and YAML and looking to Kubernetes to do more. So um, another way of looking at that is slide five where um, this is focused specifically around the past was the sort of first release of ONAP Amsterdam, and that version of it ran on OpenStack, VMware, Azure, Rackspace, and uh, it was supported VNFs. And then the uh, ONAP Casablanca that's available today uh, supports Kubernetes, and so you can run these cloud native network functions. It also supports VNFs on OpenStack. And of course, the Kubernetes part can run either on top of bare metal or in cloud. But uh, the future scenario that we have here is one that uh, we kind of want to focus on 
with this test bed, which is talking about allowing Kubernetes to be the universal substrate beneath uh, all the application function functionality that abstracts away the details of both the bare metal and any public cloud, and, and specifically supports that hybrid cloud functionality. And then um, on top of that, you can run cloud native network functions. You can run all your operating support system and business support system functions on the same clusters. Uh, if you do have some need of um, VNFs that are a legacy or that you haven't been able to port over, there's uh, this, these interesting technologies of KubeVert and Vertlet that allow you to run those uh, and manage them via Kubernetes. And then uh, in this scenario, the ONAP orchestrator is also running on Kubernetes. Um, let me just stop there for a second, since we have a, a number of new folks. A any questions so far on any of that before I, I jump into exactly what we're building here with the test bed? But that, this is sort of the context for uh, why we're building it or a vision of what we're, what we're trying to do. It's uh, star six to unmute your phone if we can't hear you. Okay, silence is consent. So uh, anyway, slide six is uh, the overview of what we've done, which is that we took uh, several VNFs, uh, virtual network functions, out of the ONAP project. And specifically, we're using the broadband network gateway um, function, which is a part of the virtual um, customer premises equipment uh, use case. And we took that identical networking code and repackaged it as a container. So in this image, it's a VNF on the left, CNF on the right, packaged in a VM or a container, running on OpenStack or Kubernetes. And then critically, the hardware is identical and um, very gratefully, uh, we're very grateful that we've been able to get access to this um, from Packet, the bare metal hosting company, um, who has worked with us quite closely on, on a bunch of issues. So um, the idea then is to be able to compare the performance of VNFs and CNFs and um, to be able to talk about best practices and changes necessary and, and um, whether there's any patches that we need to upstream to the projects and such. Um, now, I will say that there's not the expectation right now of this CNF testbed being a standalone project. It's very much meant um, as a, a market development project to show the um, value of, of, of taking this approach. But um, our expectation is to the degree that any changes are necessary, that we would be upstreaming those to Kubernetes and, and uh, other, other projects we're making use of. Uh, that could change, obviously, but there, there's no plan for it, too. And, um, okay, so slide seven. Uh, there's a whole build for this that we could get into later, but we found that this um, summary was uh, the simplest version of, of doing it, which is just to talk about um, moving between the user space and kernel um, is always going to be slow. And so uh, the vSwitch here for um, our VNS, VNF use cases uses vHost user to connect each of the VNFs together. And uh, those connections are um, always going to be slower than the middle um, scenario. Uh, we call these the snake case, where you can do a user space to user space data point, still using vSwitch, of having the CNFs um, talk together. So they're going to get a performance improvement. And then the third case uh, in yellow is what we call the pipeline case, where uh, two CNFs, and in these scenarios, we're doing a chain of three pairs of, CN of CNFs or VNFs. Um, but in the third case, the CNFs can talk directly to each other uh, using MIF connections and, and get even faster. And so slide eight is a very preliminary look of performance uh, where the um, CNF snake and pipeline cases are six to more than eight times faster than the, the VNF case. And um, there's nothing particularly shocking about this. I mean, this is all the same reasons that um, people like containers over uh, virtual machines. But um, on the other hand, it, it is, I think, useful to see. Um, I, I think the for most of this call, we're going to talk about how to try and move to slightly more realistic use cases of not just trying to maximize 
uh, packet throughput and looking at some of the other changes. Um, on slide nine, some of the other differences um, are in terms of the amount of time it takes to do the deployment from scratch. And, and I will mention that we're aiming to get this 16 minutes for Kubernetes down meaningfully by uh, removing a, a reboot that's required right now. But in terms of deploying the network functions and uh, the idle state RAM and CPU are all significantly better. On the um, runtime, you can see that it's actually using more CPU, but that's not a, a huge surprise given that it's uh, moving six times more packets through. The latency is very low in both cases, and then uh, it's the same performance numbers from the previous slide. So then the how do you engage is um, really the purpose of this call, where um, the first piece is that there's no need for anybody to take our word for it on these performance numbers. Uh, we would love to have you replicate this environment, and, and in particular, uh, Packet is happy to make an API key available to allow you to use these these pretty uh, beefy machines to uh, to do so. And then um, to the degree that we're just not doing things right, that we have um, suboptimal configurations, we would love pull requests that uh, show ways to uh, improve either the Kubernetes or the OpenStack deployments. Um, then another uh, area, the third one here, is that um, there's, this testbed isn't designed to be locked to packet. We would love to have a pull request that would enable it to run on your own bare metal servers in your lab um, or on other uh, cloud bare metal servers like the AWS ones. Um, and then the fourth is to uh, package your internal network functions into VNFs and CNFs and run on your instance of the testbed. And there's no, you don't have to share the code with us, um, but we would love to see the results. I will mention that this whole project is licensed Apache 2.0. So to the degree that it's useful to you, you can do anything you want with it. But it's not actually designed to go into production with telcos. Our, our hope here is to um, engage or interest vendors to the degree that they would be creating their own versions of that. And then, um, yeah, the final piece is, um, Right now, all of our work has been focused around uh, bare metal servers. We would love contributions or ideas on improving performance in terms of virtualized hardware, uh, such as uh, most of the offerings from Google, Alibaba, uh, Azure, and, and AWS. So then in terms of um, where to continue the conversation, uh, we're going to be doing a number of meetings at the Open Networking Summit uh, in San Jose. and. Uh, where uh, I'd be very happy to meet with any of you or your colleagues there. And then um, we will uh, try and have a boff at uh, KubeCon Barcelona. And then there's some other meetings beyond that, Shanghai, Antwerp, and, and San Diego. Um, and I'll just mention that Barcelona is on track to be a uh, blowout event where we're actually looking, aiming, uh, extrapolating right now to sell out with 12,000 attendees, which will make it the biggest open source developer conference ever. Um, and I think I will uh, stop there. There's some very useful appendix slides and other kinds of information that you should feel free to, to go through. But um, I think that's a, a kind of reasonable overview of, of why we built the test bed. So could I um, open it up again for any questions? And, and I guess I'd particularly, uh, if some of the folks who've been involved have any edits to what I just said, um, where I wasn't quite being uh, precise enough, I'd be very happy to um, to hear them of uh, suggestions on how to describe things more more clearly or correctly. I might even say. Ed Machek. Daniel and Michael, any 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 edits? Hello, uh, my name is François Thur, and I'm I'm working on core DNS, but also I'm part of Infoblox company. I had one question. I was looking at this deck during the the this weekend um, because it was presented somehow on last uh, CNCF uh, TOC. Um, I, I understood that uh, the game is to show that uh, anyway, um, because the, the efficiency is here for um, 
running uh, your uh, networking function above Kubernetes, then take advantage of Kubernetes. It's how I take the whole picture. I mean, you, you prove here that it is, um, or you prove or you, you, you want to prove or compare that anyway, it's not a networking limitation that should prevent you to move from VNF to CNF. Is, is that correct or uh, I, I misunderstood? I think that's correct. I mean, the actual performance between machines um, shouldn't be meaningfully different between VNFs and, and CNFs since the networking hardware and, and the bits over the wire and everything are, are going to be nearly identical. And so I, I think what we're trying to measure is the networking performance and, and scalability and, and memory usage and all the other kinds of metrics on how things run within a machine. But I, I'm not sure I'm addressing your question. Um, I, 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 um, so my question is uh, finally what the full purpose of this test bed because you, you say, okay, we, we, we are going from VNF to CNF is the whole purpose is, okay, you can now verify that your VNF, if your same function as a VNF has the same performance as, this, as, as this, no, sorry, the same uh, uh, networking function uh, uh, deployed as a CNF as the same performance, networking performance as, as deployed as VNF, no? And so- That's correct. So, so we're talking about, yeah taking the same NF, we call it, and packaging yes. it as a VNF or CNF. Yeah. Okay. So I went, I was wondering why, why let's say, on the, you say it's, it's natural that a container, it goes, it's lighter and goes quicker than a VM. Uh, but my wondering was, is it because on the underlying network, we are using this MEM IF instead of the virtual, uh, I don't know what they call that, B host. Is it, is it the underlying networking that, that make it more, more efficient, as you say, on, on, on container than on VMs? I don't know. That's what, the main advantage we're showing right now. Uh, go ahead, Ed, if you'd like. I, say, I don't know what to, degree, to what degree uh, folks have broken down specifically this piece versus that piece in terms of the contributions to the improved performance in CNFs. But you know, I, we can definitely, if you go back and look at the graph with the blue, red, and yellow, um, Dan, we can definitely say that the difference between the red bar here for the snake case and the yellow bar here for the pipeline case, that is definitely uh, switching from looping through a vSwitch to using direct cross connects, um, which okay. makes a ton of sense. So that piece is, those two, the difference between those two bars, the red and the yellow, I think is pretty well understood, which is you have an entirely different way of connecting connecting CNFs available um, that you don't have for VNFs, and it's a big improvement. What all contributes to the difference between the blue bar for VNFs and the red bar for CNFs in the snake case, that would require more investigation to sort of track down the difference and what contributes what to where. Okay. And, and it may, it's not entirely clear how much we can dig into that because there are just so many more limitations in the VNF case than in the CNF case. It's a little hard to tease out. Okay, thank you for the detail here. Machek, um, is that something you can speak to as far as the performance numbers that you've seen, um, you or sure. Peter or someone else, on sure, sure, the sure. So, um, between containers and VMs? Yeah, so um, I've got, uh, I wanted to make two points. <laughs> Actually, one, uh, just a comment to what that said, and uh, answering uh, Francois' uh, uh, question and the other one, a uh, question for Dan. So um, if we compare the uh, uh, VNF uh, topologies or service chains versus CNF service chains, the, uh, the difference in performance we're observing, um, and we, we observe this both as part of the CNF, CNCF, uh, CNF uh, testing, and also in the FDIO, uh, Linux Foundation Networking FDIO project that I'm working um, in, is that uh, if you compare a very simple scenarios of um, a single VNF instance and a single CNF instance, uh, both running on the, uh, with the same amount of uh, resources with, with virtual switch, 
Um, we do indeed see a bit of a difference, uh, CNF uh, configuration being faster, but, um, but it, it comes down to the, you know, the restrictions of uh, memory copy operations between, uh, between the two. And, um, and there is not that, not that much of a difference. It's at the level of uh, you know, five, um, five to, to, to 10 percent. However, once you load the topology, uh, similar to what uh, Dan presented on the, uh, on, on the slides, and you have multiple instances of the VNFs and, and CNFs with the packets being passed multiple times between those uh, virtualized uh, or containerized network functions, this difference uh, grows uh, apart. And the reason is um, efficiency of, of memory copy to a degree, but also the, um, the complete envelope of resource us usage, um, including the, um, uh, uh, the, the context switching um, uh, on, uh, for the VMs with, you know, if for the, the basically a hypervisor attacks, KVM entries and KVM exits, uh, completely um, uh, comp not being present with a, with a CNF configuration, and the cost of the, uh, the, the, copy, the copy operation. So uh, that's the approach we are uh, taking in terms of comparing VNFs and CNFs, is to instead of comparing a single instance of VNF and CNF, compare the topologies, as listed here, snakes and, and pipelines, uh, in, and, um, and filling up uh, the processor socket with multiple cores to, to really highlight the efficiency gains uh, between the VNF and CNF scenario. And we, uh, we're referring to it in our project, in the FDA the project, a service density uh, testing. And we're actually looking to, uh, to drive uh, standardization of the methodology in the ITF benchmarking working group uh, to that, uh, in that regard. And so there is uh, more uh, data available uh, in terms of um, uh, various scenarios tested um, in the FDA assisted project. And I'm happy to provide, uh, provide uh, links, if that makes sense. OK, thank you. Yes, so I, I was wrong. It's, it's not really the, I, the, the MEMIF interface. It's really the, the, the whole configuration. And, and I understand that, that we save uh, hypervisor um, that we avoid the hypervisor in, in, in the container use case. Correct. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, and um, so um, Dan, I've got a, a question regarding um, your, uh, your um, comment on uh, running the same network functions in, uh, in VNF, as VNFs and CNFs uh, from the um, ONAP uh, set. So is there a clear view on uh, what those functions are expected to be uh, going forward? Um, I mean, I, I think the second half of this call is to decide what are the next things that we can do with the test bed that are useful and that both our, you know, telco partners and our, their vendors would find constructive. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is that we could implement the full VCPE use case, which uh, Taylor could say, but I think it's like a couple dozen different network functions in it and then try and send traffic through those and talk about the, um, the performance and the, the RAM usage and the CPU usage and such um, in, in both cases. And that that would uh, almost by definition be a, a much more realistic view of, uh, of the differences between these two test sets. But uh, in some ways it might be too realistic or, or not optimized enough because um, those network functions are not necessarily designed to scale or um, have, they haven't necessarily been redefined as uh, microservices in the way that might be optimal. So I, I, I'd say that that's um, one thing that we could go focus on. Um, another kind of area that um, I, I'd say is, is maybe a little duct taped together or not optimal is that we're not really making use of the kind of core um, Kubernetes privilege, uh, primitives, at least on things like node affinities, uh, so that uh, in a more realistic scenario, you might configure several machines with uh, this, this high performance layer two uh, networking um, hardware and software on it, and then would want a way to have a Kubernetes, the kubelet know that those nodes have that capability and that containers should get scheduled to them. Um, so those are the two sort of two 
uh, immediate things that had come to my mind of, of what to do next. But um, I guess I'm curious for Taylor and Lucina, did you, is there a document today with uh, the CNF test bed that has uh, the sort of backlog of things that you could go work on? Uh, this is Taylor. We do have, I guess there's a couple of projects um, with the next, uh, the issues basically is, is the main place and then they're organized um, in the project section. Thanks Lucene for bringing that up. And um, I guess the next one is kind of tying around that Mobile World Congress. So I'm, I'm sorry, we just finished Mobile World Congress. Uh, open uh, Networking Summit, ONS, and that's in San Jose. Um, so a lot of this is tied into things that we've seen as we've moved towards the current test results and test cases and trying to make it, specifically make it where OpenStack is probably one of the biggest things where that can be repeatable to deploy that, bring it up. And now that we've got to a point where that can be brought up 100% open source, we can start getting improvements from folks. So there's a lot of things that are more of like improvements and everything. Um, there's some items on the left that IPv6 support. I know that um, Michael had been adding um, support on that. He's on the call, Hi, Michael. And I think a lot of that's done and that'll allow us to do some test cases like segmented routing. We've talked about um, using use cases that may tie in with um, using IPv6 to MPLS. So there's a lot of things that I think we're ready for and we're putting those pieces together. And maybe the next is to pick a use case that would be most desired or relevant to the community. And that may be the ONAP VCP use, VCP use case. It could be another ONAP use case. And we're also interested in other things. NSM, uh, we've been attending and collaborating with the Network Service Mesh group and there's some use that now, um, which be um, complementary for the test bed. But th this particular project, this project 21, is probably the next set of things where we're we're looking to add um, various support. Okay, I I think that's a good answer. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Taylor. And um, I, um, I do um, agree specifically on the uh, IPv6 side and, uh, and the routing side that that's something, and SRV6, as you said, that's something that uh, we should be focusing on here. Uh, as for the ONAP use cases, I think it, it's something we would need to discuss in more, uh, in more detail. But I think having a set of uh, representative service chain um, use cases with different functions in a chain would be of, um, of the benefit to the community. So I agree here with them. Thanks. Maksha, could you point us to some better chains than the VCP use case? Our only real requirement is that they be open source. Uh, understood. So from the, from the networking use case perspective, I think there are a number of um, security related uh, 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 cases. Um, uh, including you know firewall nothing and uh, and uh, and encryption uh, but in terms of uh, getting a a fully functional um open source set uh for that that's that's i guess uh, trickier but you know we we do have uh open source um uh, ips like snort and potentially um other other applications so, uh, but i think you know let me let me think about that and i'll come back with some proposals thank you I do want to point out on the Wait, ONAP yeah. side, we're not looking at um, adding the ONAP layer immediately on top. What we want to do is support all the pieces underneath, and then we'll be collaborating eventually with projects like ONAP for being able to run things. And uh, as Dan pointed out earlier, contributing back upstream to make sure that they, ONAP has a demo that runs a lot of cases, and we want to contribute any patches that go up there. And we'll be looking at adding other layers and doing things. But right now we're saying, what can we implement if we have a use case that we can review 
and look at what's there, then we can pull as much of that over into the test bed and re-implement it. And as far as the firewall security side, uh, ONAP does have um, security use cases if we want to take a look at those. And then Ed, you may have thoughts on um, some security use cases that y'all have been working on from the network service mesh side. Yeah, I mean, I think that'll start falling in a bit more into place as we scale up. And it'll, you know, you also have to sort of look from a bunch of different directions. So for example, um, often a lot of the security cases we're looking at on the network service mesh side are actually coming up from enterprise. But, you know, as the folks who do SP knows, uh, know very well, essentially the kinds of things you would do for enterprise become product that you sell if you're an SP. Um, so they become interesting there as well. I'd like to get some um, clarification on slide six, if I could, while Ed and Dan are both on the phone, because I've talked with Ed about this. So when we say um, running on top of identical on-demand hardware from bare metal hosting, um, <clears throat> so from the ground up bare metal, are we making a decision where we're saying it's going to be a software data plane, so the forwarding is going to be done the software, always for this project or are we saying that where it's going to be compatible with some type of ASIC, some type of hardware outside of smart NIC, right? So outside of the NICs being hardware, but forwarding tables and stuff like that on hardware. So I talked with Ed about this before and I, every time this subject comes up, I think it's a little bit hazy whenever I talk to like operators or any, anybody about the project. They're always thinking, you know, hardware as far as a switch and ASICs and stuff like that. So this part, if there's, if we can somehow either get clarification, say we're never doing that, or we that we're open to doing that, I think that might yeah, we're help. Certainly about about sort of magic hardware in the box. One of the things you run into is you've immediately moved into a completely bespoke world. Um, you know, generally speaking, I mean, there are some exceptions. So much past some basic acceleration that may be stuff that can be taken advantage of on the smart, on the NICs, um, effectively it becomes a build your own solution from the bottom up at great expense. Um, and we could do stuff like that, but anybody who's going to go build their own solution is then going to turn around and do it somewhat differently. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we're when we're talking about from the bare metal is it you think it'd be a good idea to say okay but we're you know we're talking about smart NICs here as well like there's specific NICs that we're saying that this works with but we're saying no ASICs like can we just say that explicitly and everybody knows what we're talking about and where we're going because at this point then we're saying it's all mostly all software yeah I mean I, I, Watson I might make two edits to it um, one is that if the ASICs are publicly available, and I mean, in particular, if they're available via, you know, on-demand service from Packet or from a similar company like that, then I, I'd certainly be open to having a version of the test bed that, that works with them. It's just, it, if it's, if they're not, then it's just, it's not something that we can test or that anybody else can iterate on and, and see the impact of. Yeah, so there are um, open ASICs, and that's where, um, and they're like part of, I believe some of them are part of Linux Foundation. Nobody's, I don't think there's any that's part of CNCF, though. So this is something I've talked about with the group, and we never, I never really can come to a, a clear, definite, no, we're not doing that, or yes, we are. So it sounds like maybe it's, oh, we're open to it. It, it, it. Yeah, it's sort of more of a maybe, and particularly if a vendor wanted to come in and say, hey, we've made these cards available to Packet and they're, they're going to be running in some class of machines and we'd like the test bed to show the performance improvement of using those. Um, that's, and, 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 and most importantly, and we're willing to contribute the code that you know, um, supports that use case. I, I would be thrilled for that scenario. I mean, I that's totally not that, that far that. removed yeah, from saying, oh, well, you know, can Mellanox come in and show the value of using a Mellanox NIC over an Intel NIC. And as long as they're um, 
willing to make the contributions and, and you know, that they're open source and, and in the same project under Apache 2.0. And we're not requiring the firmware be open source, but just that the, all the configuration parameters and such, then we'd be thrilled to accept pull requests on the subject. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I, I do think it's, I, I think it's very fair to say, oh, you know, most production use, use cases today are not using commodity hard, hardware and commodity, commodity mix. Now there's a, a sort of separate question of what should they be doing more of that in the future? But I, I don't really consider it our job to decide that. I mean, if, if, if in fact we did get folks with smart mix coming and sort of helping to build out things that are replicatable patterns, that would be an amazing thing, right? Because that's typically not what's happened so far in the industry. And I think it would be good overall for the industry if that were to what would occur out of this. But you're skeptical that will occur. Well, you know, sometimes the horse learns to fly. Yeah. Um, so could we uh, chat about for a second um, where we stand with the Mellanox Nick since we just brought it up? And I, I did happen to run into some of our colleagues from Mellanox in, in Barcelona. Well, um, that was our first target on packet because that was what was publicly available. Um, they're releasing Intel next in March and we actually got pre-release of those to start testing and helped, um, helped packet create or decide on the configuration for the Intel versions and like the networking goals. Um, we have, support for the Mellanox ConnectX4. So that's the version that they're using. And we can deploy all the different, um, we, we support OpenStack, Kubernetes, KVM and Docker, um, KVM and Docker only machines, all on the um, Mellanox. And we've been able to use those. The limitations are the drivers are not open source and the there's some weird things that aren't expected with how they show up in linux um, as far as the interfaces they don't act like we would expect but we've worked around those and understand what's going on there and then uh, there's some issues with, well i won't say issues performance is lower i'll just put that out then than it is on others. We don't, we don't know exactly why that is. Um, Michael, do you remember the open, it seems like there was a bug or maybe Ed, it seems like we had to patch something. Maybe it happened in VPP because a, a driver issue on, on Mellanox. Um, yeah. That was months back. Yeah, so I mean, the, 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 the Mellanox story on drivers continues to improve. Um, they have sort of dropped a note indicating that they, they have moved away from requiring the OEF, OEF, OFED stuff. Um, and so I'm quite hopeful that that will improve that situation greatly. It's been a long road with them, but God bless them. They've stuck with us through the whole thing. Um, so it may turn out to be easier to get Mellanox support in the future. We just have to go see. Yeah, but it, it would be worthwhile at this point for me to connect them in at the corporate level and see if they want to engage at all. I think we oh, should now. Any, yeah, any think of the folks creating this, um, both the cards and drivers, and try and encourage them to move towards open source model on all of that and have a common interface. And just okay. On the performance issue, um, I think that's mainly due to the way we have to configure it, since we only have one port available. So we have to to do some of the VLAN encapsulation and decapsulation in the vSwitch. Um, we don't have to do that on the Intel, but I think we're planning on setting up an environment using Intel that does the same thing, just so we have a a better grounds for comparison. Yeah, to expand on that, it's dual port. Uh, two ports on the Mellanox and the 
quad port, four ports on the um, on the Intel for packet. And we'll, we're going to test by limiting Intel to two ports to, to look at the performance and compared to the Mellanox. Yeah, there, there, there's actually another interesting option in this space as well, um, which is I believe right now you're using the DPDK drivers for the Intel mix. And they're for Intel recently has something called ABF, which is a standardization of the uh, binary interface for their NICs, both existing and they've made a commitment well into the future. And VPP now has direct support for AVF, meaning that it can now take advantage of Intel NICs without DPDK. And the preliminary results on performance indicate that that's much faster than using the DPDK drivers. Uh, so there's a whole other branch that could be explored there as well that might give interesting results. So I, I'd love to use our remaining 15 minutes to chat about what else we should do. Um, what, what other work here uh, would be useful from a, a market development perspective? Um, just uh, there is something that I've not seen in the, in the repository and at least in the documentation. It's about uh, how uh, a VNF vendor has to transform it's VNF to become CNF compatible and to benefit from the pipeline that you described earlier and the high throughput that is uh, that should be available in this pipeline. I'm not sure it is in the scope of this project, but it could be interesting for vendors to better understand the, the limit and what does to be done. Yeah, that, that's actually a really interesting uh, thing to document. Because I, I think effectively what it comes down to is the number one thing is a BNF vendor to transition to being a CNF would need to move their data plane purely into user space because they, they, you have the immutable infrastructure limitations of cloud native. So you can't keep doing things in kernel modules anymore. Um, so that would be sort of the, the table stakes for being a CNF. And then for the pipelining stuff, uh, it turns out the MIF stuff is pretty well documented. And there's also a libmimif that can be used in pretty much any CNF you want to build in order to be doing the pipelining behavior. Um, or you always have the option of simply building on VPP, it, which is free and open source and Apache 2 licensed. I think beyond the some of the hardware performance and our network performance stuff that would tie in with mimif and other things would be looking at VNFs that may offer multiple services. Some of them may be really large and then looking at breaking those down. That's just following what would you do cloud native um, direction anyways. And when you start doing that, the density and workload on the machines is going to be more flexible. Um, so that's probably going to be an area to look at. Um, some of that's, may come about when we start looking at other use cases. I don't think it's going to be a one size fit all. I think we'll probably have here's some guidelines and then here's some specific things to start looking at. If, if there is a VNF out there though that um, anyone has or they're saying we'd like to see this running, um, especially if you have a minim more minimal use case or something documented or can be documented. Love to take a look at that. And that could help like create a guide for other folks to contribute. You are mentioning the VPC use case. So are you what are you seeking about uh, one uh, VEPC uh, uh, especially or uh, the ONAP VCPE use case was just one that okay. um, we kind of started with is here's something we're looking at targeting we ended up 
um, refocusing on components within that to do benchmarking against the systems are running and other things. So that was more of, if you actually look at that use case, which I'll drop in the chat, um, it has a lot of components. And the, the one that we we're mainly focused in is labeled V Bing BNG. Oh, thanks for bringing that up, Lucina. So on the left, there's home networks. Mm. Um, it's kind of hard to see in this, but uh, the BNG, those are, it's kind of the edge. So where things come in and that's where most of the tests that you're going to see right now have been focused on the last couple of months and that's um, doing IP routing. So um, just trying to get the performance and baseline numbers and this also tied in with stuff that the Linux FDIO project does in the CSIT lab. So we're able to really get the baseline and see if those performance numbers make sense, then start building on that. So this use case may be something that we wanna implement next, um, finish all the pieces, because we've actually done several of the other network functions. But if there's a totally different use case, either at ONAP, which they have some, or another project or a vendor or anyone else, um, be happy to look at one. Um, specifically if you know higher priority to ones where there's code available to review up you know open source we can review it and, and or specifications about how it's implemented so that we can see what we would do to implement that and of course if someone wants to contribute a test case that would be even better code for implementing So besides documentation on how someone could create CNFs or migrate a VNF to CNF, are there any other items that folks would really like to see? Okay, um, Dan, what would you like to do next? Yeah, I, th I think we can stop there. I guess I'll just mention that we don't have a mailing list right now, but we do have the uh, GitHub issues that folks can feel free to open. And then um, and we have the CNF channel on Slack. And um, we'll need to see whether um, a twice a month frequency makes sense here, or maybe we're going to want to drop it back to once a month or um, incorporate with something else. But uh, we're definitely open to uh, thoughts or suggestions. And, you know, hopefully we will be getting other organizations that are interested in, in replicating these results and ideally contributing some code. Um, so we'll, we'll cross our fingers that uh, there's going to be some uptake now that we're doing uh, more publicity around it. So uh, I'd suggest we stop there, unless anyone else would like to uh, suggest something. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, bye.